figure this out. This meeting is being recorded. Okay, I was able to start the recording. All right, Laura Lee, I don't know why this has happened. This never happened before to me that I'm I'm not treated as the admin who start launches the meeting. Yeah, so we'll we'll figure it out. Well, hopefully. <laughs> I hope so. Here's Kim DeLeo joining us. Welcome, Kim. And all right, let's just launch this meeting. This is the uh, general meeting of the Brentwood Darlington Neighborhood Association for the month of November. We're going to be dark in December. We'll meet again in uh, January. On the agenda, we have um, first uh, introductions that we'll we'll do. We'll then have our forum exploring Brentwood Darlington, and we have uh, our uh, our local photography Ashley Bem, who will speak to us. We then have a presentation about the Woodstock um, food pantry from guest speaker Chris Gustafson, and then uh, I'd love to hear from Linda Goldser, a uh, some news from Master Gardeners. Just. Just a few words, and and then we have some items of public uh, interest that I can uh, speak to, and so can Laura Lee, and then that will be our meeting. So why don't we start with some introductions? Just please uh, say your name, um, your role, if you're a director, advisor, board member at large, whatever, and um, uh, or resident, and uh, say what it, it about. Um, your role or about the neighborhood really concerns or delights you most. Um, okay, uh, Tina, would you like to go first? Sure, I'm Tina and I've been part of the neighborhood off and on for since, the, I don't know, 1999 or so. And uh, I'm an advisor. I have been a board member in the past and schedule and, and life choices dictate that I'm not right now. Um, what feeds my soul and what keeps driving me in the neighborhood is feeding the people and connecting, um, whether it's via food preparation, environmental services, and recycling and repurposing, um, and crafting, and just basic general feeding the soul. That That's what I do. Okay, well, and, and you do it wonderfully. Thank you so much. And uh, Gail, why don't you go next? Hey, for the first time, I didn't have a problem logging on. My sound <laughs> works, my video works. <laughs> I've had a great week. <laughs> okay, Laura Lee, we've identified the problem. She's taken all the um, good sass away from us. and <laughs> it, it had to work eventually. <laughs> <laughs> Friendly reminder that the craft circle will only meet next Thursday, not not on Thanksgiving. Even Goodwill's closed on Thanksgiving. Oh my goodness. Okay. <laughs> Very fine. And what about the neighborhood delights or concerns you most? We had a life? lot of people decorate for Halloween. It was really fun. We weren't the only house on the street that decorated. Oh, nice. Oh, yeah. good. Okay. And a did lot you... of trick or treaters. Of course, I bought way too much candy, but still. <laughs> Oh, very good. So you got yeah. a lot of trick or treaters. Yeah. I've, I've never had many on my street. Yeah, so I'm happy good. You. Um, uh, Lisa Jamison. Hi, I'm Lisa Jamison. I moved here almost exactly a year ago to this neighborhood. I was in Woodstock before that, and before that, forty years in Alaska. I'm a retired social worker, and I'm an advisor to the board. And I love the diversity in this community. My street has at least six languages spoken on my block which is really cool and lots of different sizes and shapes of families and shades of colors of people. And anyway, so yeah, my interest is in, you know, strengthening the, the um, neighborhood association and um, the community center. I really want to see the community center come alive and be a place that supports this community. Mm -hmm. Oh, very fine. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, Linda, why don't you uh, speak, speak to us? Hi, I'm Linda Goldser. Um, I am the uh, one of the coordinators of the Multnomah County Master Gardener Demonstration Garden off of 57th, um, close by uh, the park. And um, I've been coming to these board meetings for a little over um, three years now. Very interested in community. 
Oh, uh, yeah, and, and I can vouch for that, that Linda is very interested in community and I'm delighted that you're joining us tonight. Thank you. Uh, uh, Kim DeLeo, why don't you introduce yourself? Hi, good evening, Kim DeLeo. I am a director on uh, for the Neighborhood Association and I sit on the uh, Southeast Uplift Board as a representative for Brentwood Darlington. And I, uh, what drives me is community engagement and hopefully making a positive contribution to the neighborhood. So happy to be here and happy to see everybody. Yeah, and we're delighted that you're here. It's wonderful to see you then. Uh, Laura Lee, why don't you introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Laura Lee here, let me see. Here I am, kind of in the dark, wow. <laughs> Uh, I'm going to stay off camera tonight, though, because I'm going to be running around and not sitting in front of my computer like I've been doing for the past eight hours at work. Um, I am a director on um, with Brentwood Darlington as secretary on the board. And um, what keeps me uh, interested is I'm very nosy and I want to know what's going on in our neighborhood. And um, I learn a lot from these meetings. Okay, well, we're we're very happy to have you, and thank you for the your work you you do as a secretary, and also you get involved in neighborhood stuff that's compelling and interesting, and sometimes uh, uh, a, a bit on the rough side, right? When you have neighbors like the kind you had for a while there, but they're gone, um, largely because of you. So very good, and so Ashley and uh, Chris. Um, We'll save your introduction for when you you're you're scheduled to uh, be on the stage. So the, which will just be in a moment, um, and I'll wrap up the introductions here. Uh, I'm Stephanie Frederick. I'm the chair of the Brentwood Darlington Neighborhood Association, which is a great honor and also a, a great challenge. Um, I'm very interested in trying to get the neighborhood association system going again. And I think that Brentwood Darlington Neighborhood Association in particular can do some really important work in this community. And like, like um, the rest of you, I'm very interested in community building and into creating a network of people who help one another. And, um, you know, we're going to need that. The times are getting more perilous and complicated as we move forward. And the more we can be linked on the ground positively, the better able we're gonna be able to uh, deal with um, with societal unraveling, which I think is, uh, is certainly coming our way. So anyway, thanks uh, for the honor of being the chair. I am overextended, but I actually really like uh, the work very much. And um, all right, so that's enough from me. Uh, I would like very much to introduce our special guest and Brentwood Darlington resident, uh, Ashley Bem. Is it Bem or Bem? How do you pronounce your last name? It's Bem. Oh, Bem, I beg your pardon, I'm sorry. Okay. No worries. Most people Bame. say Bem. <laughs> oh, like, okay. But that, it's German. <laughs> all right, well, uh, um, so you are our special guest in our forum, Exploring Brentwood Darlington, and we're looking very much forward to hearing about your home-based business and about you. Go ahead. Yeah, uh, well, thanks for having me. Um, I do have a little like slideshow. I was hoping to share my screen. Can oh, you very fine. You should be able to. Yeah. Um, yes. Do you see at the bottom of your screen, the um, is the share screen? Okay, very fine. Yeah. Good. Did that work for you guys? Okay, cool. Um, so yeah, hi, I'm Ashley. Um, I use she, her pronouns, and I'm a maternity, newborn, and family photographer. And I have a home studio in the Brentwood Darlington neighborhood. Um, and so I also just want to say thanks again for having me tonight. I'm just like really grateful to be a part of this community. Um, and I'm a I'm a newish mom. My son is about one and a half. So one of the things that's been really great in the past year and a half has been like connecting with other moms in the neighborhood and meeting people at the playgrounds and in the park. Um, that's been really fun and exciting for us. And we've been able to connect with a lot more people in the community um, 
being new parents. So that's been fun. Um, so I have been honing my photography skills for, let's see, nine, yep, um, for about two decades. And I've been specialized in maternity, newborn, and family photography for the last six years. And I absolutely love my job. And I love that I get to document some of life's most amazing and beautiful moments for families. Um, when I'm not behind the camera, you'll most often find me out in my garden or chasing around my one and a half year old, um, or maybe we're at home reading books together when the weather is rainy outside, but we like to be outside a lot. Um, and so, yeah, I specialize in creating beautiful, authentic, and timeless portraits for growing families, from photographing that special waiting period before baby arrives, to documenting all of their tiny details once they make their grand entrance, to adventurous family sessions out in nature. I'm here to help families remember it all for years to come. And my photography style is very clean and fresh and minimalistic. I really like to focus on the people in the photo and not have things be distracted by like lots of props or anything like that. And so um, I own a full service portrait studio. And again, it's in my house. So it's right in the neighborhood. We are right across from Lane Middle School. Um, and then every session that I do is completed with an online viewing and design session to help families preserve their images in a physical form. So whether that's an album for the coffee table or a few frame prints for their walls, I really like to help make sure that people actually print their photos and enjoy them um, and that they come to life in their home. And so I, as I mentioned, I specialize in maternity photos. And so I love this part of life. It's like a really special waiting period as people prepare to meet their new baby. Um, and being invited into some of these spaces where I get to photograph people is really special. And I just think it's really cool that I get to do that. Um, and so maternity sessions can either happen in my studio or outdoors. Um, oftentimes people want to include the whole family, which is great. Sometimes moms just want to be by themselves and have more of like an intimate maternity moment for them. Um, so I do either or. And I always recommend that people get their maternity photos taken between 30 to 35 weeks um, when their bump is well defined, but they're not too uncomfortable yet. Um, and then I always recommend that people reach out in their second trimester to get on my calendar because uh, I book up quickly. And the sooner we have time to plan, the more we can just like make things really simple and easy. So I, after maternity photos, I of course love to take newborn photos. So that's really my, my specialty. Um, and they all take home, place in my home studio. Um, and I like to do newborn photos somewhere in those first like five to 14 days of life because that's when they're still really tiny and curled up like they were in the room. And they're also still really sleepy at this point. So it's pretty easy to like get those sleepy baby photos. Um, but I always like to tell people that it's never too late to photograph your baby. So sometimes I have people who like, you know, maybe didn't plan ahead and all of a sudden their baby arrives and they're like, oh my gosh, I need to photograph this baby because they're so cute. Um, and so I always tell people to still reach out because I want to help make sure they get these photos. Um, so I photograph babies at basically every single month throughout their first year. Um, and so I'm happy to take them whenever people you know, decide to call me. <laughs> um, and then of course I love to do family photos. Oh, I do milestone sessions too in my studio. So typically um, these happen around like three months and six months and nine months and then one year photos. We like to do uh, smash cake smash sessions in the studio. And again, I keep things pretty minimalistic and um, you know, we like to just really focus on the baby and their beautiful expressions and their unique personalities. So, um, and then as I was gonna say, uh, family sessions typically take place outdoors and I really work to make them fun and engaging. Um, we laugh and we play games and we keep things really lighthearted. Um, I know kids like to run around and be silly. And so I like to try and help them do that in a way that, you know, still creates really beautiful portraits. And so 
while I really love to get that one photo where everybody is smiling and looking at the camera, I also love to photograph those in-between moments when families are interacting with each other um, because I think that's where like all the real magic happens. So, so yeah. And then I kind of mentioned this earlier, but I also help people actually print their photos. So I help them create custom albums for the coffee table or pieces for their wall so that they actually enjoy their images and they come to life in your home because I think it's just really important that we actually print our photos. And so I work with families throughout the entire process and the entire photographic experience to make sure that they actually leave with something tangible in their hands. So yeah, that is me and my business. And the, this is where you can find me. I have a website, it's ashleybainphotography.com. And I'm often on Instagram. Uh, I spend most of my social media energy on Instagram. That's about all I have the energy for. <laughs> and I, again, and just Ashley Bain Photography. So if you want to follow me, please do. Um, and if you have any questions about my work, feel free to email me. Um, my email is ashley at ashleybainphotography.com. And that's it. Do you have any questions for me? So um, I have a question. Thank you very much. It's a, a very nice uh, presentation. That So do your uh, customers come from all over Portland or mainly local or what? Uh, what would you say? Yeah, mostly, uh, yeah, all over Portland, really. Um, I've even had some people come down from Vancouver. Um, but yeah, kind of all over. <laughs> and um, do you advertise or is it word of mouth or how do, how do you um, get your customers? Yeah, um, a lot of it is word of mouth. Um, and then a lot of people find me on Google. Uh, I've, worked, I've been working really hard over the past couple of years to just really work on my website and my website presence and my SEO. And so a lot of people find me on Google. Some people find me on Instagram. Um, and then prior to COVID, I did a lot more like in-person networking type events. Um, and I haven't really dipped my feet in that kind of stuff since 2020, but I have a goal of like trying to do some more events like that. Um, so, so I can meet more people out just like in general. So oh, very good. Yeah. So yeah. Who photographed you and your little son and your husband? <laughs> yeah. Great question. Um, so I have a, a woman, there's a woman in St. Salem actually who mentored me and so I learned how to like pose babies from her and so when I got pregnant she was the first person I called <laughs> <laughs> oh very fun okay. and yeah I had her do ours yeah <laughs> sounds like you're a good team then yeah okay so um do others have questions for Ashley I don't have a question I just want to say they're really beautiful images thank you well, thank you I, I appreciate that yeah, no, they, they really are. Um, okay, well, so um, those of us who know pregnant uh, ladies uh, may... Uh, yeah, please send them uh, my <laughs> yeah, Right, yeah, no, we, we can do that. So, uh, all right, and you say you live right across from Lane School? Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay, wonderful. Yeah. Well, we will um, make sure that we... we write a takeaway about your work that we will publish to our email list and put on our website so that you'll you'll get more uh, exposure than uh, only just this meeting and um thank, well, you. thank you so thank much you. for for coming and telling us about um your business and yourself you you absolutely thanks for beautiful having me. photographs very exciting mm -hmm. uh, i'll stop my share now yeah okay thank very so fun. thank you thank you ashley all right, and then our next, um, we have uh, our guest speaker, who is Chris Gustafson, and she's um, is the co-director of the um, Woodstock Phone Food Pantry. Oh, I'm a volunteer. Oh, you're a volunteer. Excuse me. Okay, right. Well, well, would you uh, like to tell us all about the uh, Woodstock Food Pantry, please? I would. Um, I'm Chris, she, her, I live in Brentwood, Darlington uh, on 77th and rural. And um, so I'm very grateful for all the work that the BDNA is doing. Uh, I have two kids, at, two grandkids at Lane and one grandkid at Franklin. So 
um, I, I'm a, this neighborhood is so important to me. And I, I loved your question about what makes you happy about the neighborhood or what concerns you. Mm. Um, I love our little free libraries. Um, when Zoe was building them and putting them all out, um, that was wonderful to me. And I've, some of you might know me from my weekly posts in Brentwood Darlington Connected Neighbors because I'm the one that goes around and puts a book that I bought from a black owned bookstore in one of our little free libraries and gives you like the treasure hunt coordinates of how to find it every week. So um, why, the reason I asked to come and talk with you about the um, food pantry is because um, as Stephanie pointed out, times are hard for many folks. And for the last year and a half, um, I've been in volunteering at the Woodstock Food Pantry. Woodstock Food Pantry is housed at All Saints Episcopal Church. It's on 41st and Woodstock. And I had not done, um, I'm, a, I'm a retired uh, library teacher uh, from Seattle. And also I've done some work in Portland Public Schools and I still sub for them and do some other library stuff. But I had not really done anything with um, housing insecurity before I became involved at the Woodstock Pantry. So what I really want you to know is, is what we offer um, an adjacent neighborhood, but we serve people from all over. Um, Brentwood Darlington people will, I hope be, or I know they do use um, what we have to offer. And the more you know, um, I, don't, I don't know about you, but sometimes I have in the past felt very um, perplexed or um, not sure what to do when I meet someone who's housing insecure. And the wonderful thing about our food pantry is we're always a place you can send folks. And we're all, we, we have some tools that can, can uh, help people in a lot of different housing or a lot of different food insecure situations. So here's what the Woodstock Pantry does for our community. Um, every Friday at 12 o'clock, we open the doors um, in the, this is in the, the, we actually serve people out of the back of the church and people line up. We serve people in their cars, which is a little unusual for a food pantry. And it's a real benefit for people who are, um, have a little trouble walking or, you know, just really for various reasons, don't want to get out of their cars and come in to use the shopping model, which other pantries use. And that's great. This is just, we don't have the capacity to do that. So people will drive up in their car or they'll walk up some people walk or take the bus or, you know, get to us. We have a lot of people that bike to us or scoot on their scooters. And so um, a team goes out to welcome the people who are there. We're um, like most food pantries, part of the Oregon Food Bank. And so we welcome people. We have um, uh, we, we never turn anyone away for food. But if people will allow us to uh, have a little basic information about them, we can sign them in to the food, Oregon Food Bank. And um, the more people we serve, the more food we're allowed to get from the Oregon Food Bank. So that's, and you know, we tell people, you know, we understand if you don't want to let us know anything or much about you, but if we can just get a few details, that will help others as well. So people will come. We have um, a bag of shelf stable canned goods that we have to offer them every week. Uh, earlier that day, a crew of people has been unloading the Oregon Food Bank truck. Another group has come in, and these are. 80% are community members who volunteer, about 20% are people from the uh, All Saints Parish. Um, and those people have been putting, they've been preparing 150 bags of canned goods and 150 bags of produce. And the, the, um, the lady who's from the Brentwood Darlington Gardens, oh my gosh, several of the community gardens at Brentwood Darlington um, gave us produce this summer and we were so, we made people so happy with the vegetables and fruit we were able to share. So those, all those bags are lined up and ready to go. And we have a meat and, a, and if eggs, if we can get them and vegan options. And so the people drive up and we have uh, people that go and check them in and welcome them warmly and uh, other people that come and take their order and then other people that deliver it to their car. And so that's, that's the procedure that happens from 12 to two uh, every Friday and every Saturday. So that's, um, that's the, the food pantry part of what happens at All Saints. Then also on Saturdays um, at about 11 or 11.15, 11 folks start drifting in or invited to come and drift into the parish hall of the church where they will be served a sit down hot meal. And the uh, um, hot meal time is a time of community. Um, a lot of the people that come to hot meal are lonely, um, Many are unhoused or minimally housed. Um, some of them, for some of them, it's the only time, for many of them, I think it's the only time someone serves them a meal during the week. 
um, one of our one of our neighbors who um, who who comes there to eat also plays the piano for us. And there's there's pleasant music. There's a wait staff that's been trained in trauma informed practices that helps to serve our, our guests. We have a, um, a, a social worker there who's just there to make sure that people feel calm and can manage how they're feeling and um, can kind of settle everybody down if anyone is feeling agitated or worried. So um, that's hot meals. And then people, when they go, if there's food left over, they take hot meals with them. Some people come and aren't, don't feel like they can come and sit down, but they can get a hot meal to go. So that hot meals part is going on from about 11, 15, and they're pretty much wrapped up by about 12:30. At the same time that that's going on, Cultivate Initiatives brings their shower and um, washing machine truck and uh, sets it up in the parking lot of the church and um, puts all the, you know, attaches all the hoses and folks can come and wash their clothes and take a shower. Um, along with that, the Cultivate people and, and also um, All Saints has, uh, some of you might know their, their um, secondhand store in the basement of the church, the Mustard Seed. In addition to that secondhand store, the folks at the Mustard Seed have created a free clothing closet that's available to volunteers. So if someone comes to us at any point of any of these times I've described to you and needs clothes, um, we'll say, what do you need? And we can go down to the clothing closet and, and bring them up a bunch of choices to, that they can select from. Um, but the Cultivate Initiatives people that bring the shower truck also bring some clothing as well. So that's going on in our parking lot. There's a big tent out there. And also under the tent are some Concordia University nursing students. And uh, our Friday food pantry or Saturday food pantry is a uh, on the rotation for Concordia University's nursing students. And every six weeks, a new group and their supervisor rotate in and they offer um, just initial health services and consults for people that have uh, I've seen uh, I've seen unhoused people that are really struggling with um, uh, cold related issues like they may have some frostbite they might have um, i've seen people with cut feet or cut hands from being outside um, and so those nursing students are there to just make that first step so um, I, I know that a lot of times when we hear about housing or food insecurity and and we meet people that are food insecure we, we're at a loss of to say what you know where you can go for resources or how you can help and i just want to let you know that this is a resource here in our community, um, staffed by your neighbors, serving your neighbors. Um, and we serve, um, we've been serving about 150 units of people and every unit we serve, that's every week. And every unit we serve is, is anywhere from one to six people in a, in a family. Um, and we serve people that are all the way from, um, so I, I was I was going out and, and taking an order and a woman drove up and she got out of her car and she was wearing a um, Portland Association of Teachers Union T-shirt. And I said, oh, you're a teacher and I'm you know, a retired teacher. And so we're chatting and she said, well, I'm actually a, a teaching assistant. And, and I know how much less they get paid than teachers and teachers don't make huge bucks. And so I said, oh, my gosh, you know, you, that that can be a really hard salary to get by on. And she said, yeah, that's why I'm here. So there's a person that's just not quite making it stretch. Um, and then I've, I've had people that come through the, the walk-up line and they say, my tent was swept last night. I don't have anything. I don't have any pants. I don't have any socks. I have nothing to eat. And we have, um, we have we call it the choose your own adventure um, uh, choices when folks come and if they don't have a place to, to store and cook food or heat it up, we have um, ready to go bags. We have things they can take that can, you know, have pop off tops and don't need to be there, you know, they don't need to be preserved or cooked or anything. It's just something they can eat. People come and they'll just say, I'm so hungry right now. What can you give me? And so that we've got, you know, a whole set of resources that are devoted to that. So that's who we are. That's what we do. And um, I just want to make sure that people know about it so you can, um, I guess, feel hopeful and encouraged that there's a, a resource so close to our neighborhood boundaries. Um, you, including um, Lindsay Stranigan from, you know, some of you know her from some of the, the many neighborhood activities as part of, um, she cooks at the hot meals and there's lots of, lots of BDNA people type people in, in, in this work. And we just want you to know we're there and, and ready to help.
So what are you wondering? Oh my gosh, I'm so overwhelmed by what you've just said. I, I, I don't know what to inquire uh, about. Um, so, but I do have one question. When you say 150 units of people, is that per week? Is that is that what? You yes. Yes, that's yeah. So I'm my actually we're usually work together, but this weekend we're splitting up because I've got something else on Friday. But my my husband's working the Friday shift. You know they'll serve um, probably seventy five people, and then I'll work the Saturday shift or seventy five units, and then the my husband I'll work the Saturday, and we'll probably have another seventy five go out the door. Mm -hmm. um, and so does your church have a commercial kitchen with big washing dishwashing machine and that sort of thing, or? We do for the hot meals prep. Yep. Uh huh. And how long? Do you, oh, do you, ahead, need, Lisa. you need volunteers, and how do people volunteer if they want to help? Yeah. So you can just go to um, uh, All Saints Church, and there's All Saints Episcopal Church website, and there's a connection to that. And Kristen Magus is our um, our staff person, and she's just fabulous. She um, we have. Um, it, we get interns from uh, Reed College and she's always um, connecting people and, you know, help finding, you know, people places where they, and we use, obviously we, we use tons of volunteers. So um, there's always that going on. And the volunteers, um, the volunteers make their own communities as well. You know, the people that, that pack the groceries are their own little community and are looking out for each other. And, you know, I'm on the distribution shift and one of my friends from the distribution shift that I didn't know till we all just showed up at, you know, on Friday and started working together, saw that that we weren't signed up together and my husband doesn't drive. And she texted me and said, hey, I can come pick up Wayne tomorrow. So, you know, I can give him a ride. So people, the volunteer communities are are a nice a, a nice extension of what we want to be as a neighborhood as well. Oh, it, it just sounds incredible. I had no idea. It is. No it idea. is. And people don't know. So, yeah. Uh, no, I, I, I didn't know. And so how I am, I imagine this started at a lower level and it's, it's uh, gained momentum and various new dimensions and so on. Um, how long yep. have you been associated with? with uh, I've been working there a year and a half. A year and a half. Okay. So, and had, and and you found when you started working it it had the hot meals and the Friday Saturday mm -hmm. and and so on yeah so it was yep. already in in the uh, truck that brings the showers and washing machines so it was yep. already pretty well developed by the time yes. that you, uh, you began um, wow well it's just extraordinary and I'm really happy to know about it that it's a place where we can um, refer. People. Absolutely. When yeah. when I started a year and a half ago, we served about 45 eating units per shift. And now this last week, we were at 75 for the Friday shift, the last one I worked. So um, we, we joke it's because our Yelp reviews are good. But, <laughs> but you know, you know that it's because there's need to. No, that's so. right. The need is growing. I, I know that yes. the, the Francis Center said that it's so yeah, many, many, many more people than right than, than they were. Yeah, and they're open more days than us. And our our goal is to um, get to know our neighbors that we serve. Um, uh, it, you know, we now we you know people come on Fridays just because they know the Friday shift and they know they'll ask after them. You know, my my friends that I serve with, you know, we know who likes white bread and who likes wheat, and um, we try to make our neighbors who come to get food from us feel welcome and special. And, you know, you know, we tell, you know, we share our lives a little bit with them and they share their lives with us. And um, mm -hmm. we really want to provide that family feeling. And people have told us they come because um, because they feel like it's a place where people really care about them and are happy to see them. And we are. We, we do care about them and we do are happy to see them. And we get worried if they don't show up. And so these are the, the people who serve are coming from from Woodstock neighborhood and Brentwood Darlington and just neighborhoods all around or? Uh... They, yeah, so both. So, you know, so we have people that are um, unhoused that live nearby. We're obviously a quick spot for them. Um, when we get new people, which is every week, I always ask them how they heard about us. And often they just go on the Oregon Food Bank page and some people will say, you were the closest to me or I was hungry and you were the only one open on Friday or 
you know, there, there are a ton of reasons why people come. We did it. We mapped. We did the data and we mapped and we we actually serve a really wide group. And people come to us because I think because they know us and they develop those relationships. And um, mm -hmm. yeah. All right. And so you received donations uh, from the Oregon Food Bank. Mm -hmm. I know that you receive donations from the Master Gardeners while it's. Yes. Uh, yes, we do. So I so I I began volunteering at the demo garden this last year, and mm, maybe mm -hmm. I might have sent you some blackberries. You which, might, and they were if you did, they were really good, and people loved them. Because <laughs> I can't be really credit for the blackberries, but I picked I picked sure. them. <laughs> carefully and carefully put them in those little boxes so they wouldn't yes. get squished. We have um, we also have a GoFundMe page which will be going up soon because we are trying to build. Um, right now we have. Um, a storage area across the back of the um, of the church, um, the nave in Episcopal churches, it's the nave. Um, so at the front, you know, there's like the altar and, and you know, the, the part that's the church kind of maybe looking up. And in the back, there's all the shelves of food, which is the church looking out. Um, but eventually we would like to not have to store our food in the back of the worshiping area. <laughs> so we're raising some money so we can build a, um, a storage and service place out in our parking lot. So it'll be a little, um, a little more seamless that way. Okay, very fine. Um, all right. Well, when um, when you do get that GoFundMe page going, uh, be sure and get in touch with me. Oh yes, I'll, I will do I'll that. Put it out to our email list, and that I'll would be so that. kind. Yeah. Okay. Wonderful. That and um, oh my gosh, I had another. Oh, so how, where do you get your clothing donations? Oh, wow. Um, all everybody brings this stuff. I mean, people from the church bring it, but you know, it's we on Fridays, they have a little note that says on Friday, you can donate. So people come, people just come and, you know, kind of like they would at Goodwill, I guess, and bring stuff. It's not nearly as big an operation as that. It's a little, it's a little thing, but the women of the church made $25,000 last year from it. And they donated it all to the, um, the food pantry work. So, oh, really? um, it's really fabulous. Yeah, the mustard seed is amazing. Twenty five thousand from selling also uh, donated clothes. You stuff. Oh wow. Yeah, and you know stuff. Also, we um, we need paper bags. Some of you have seen me. I'm the one that's always begging for paper bags on buy nothing, because every one of those um, bags of canned food and and you know everything has to be in something before we can hand it to somebody. So. Uh huh. Yeah. So do you take? used paper bags absolutely all the time oh okay <laughs> yeah right. so i go pick them up off people's porches and you know i'm i'm the paper bag scavenger uh-huh okay no that's um that's good to know because one tends to build up a little pile one does <laughs> indeed <laughs> even if one tries to use the cloth bags um you need the exactly. paper bags. all right okay that's good to know and um to go back to the clothing for a moment what items are most useful? Um, I think that the things that are most useful are pants for adults that don't require a precise size. So sweatpants or anything with an elastic waist is, I mean, that for, uh, you know, anything, you, you know, if you donate it to sell, you know, you know, pretty much anything in good condition goes, but for the, our, our unhoused or people, particular unhoused neighbors, that can be really helpful. And, um, I had to turn away a man because I didn't have any sh men's shoes that were big enough. So larger size men's shoes. I think he was an 11, which I think is a kind of an unusual size. But um, it broke my heart that that I didn't have any shoes I could give him and didn't know how to get any. So mm -hmm. um, we just have some larger men's shoes on hand. That could be a thing. I see. Okay. And socks. You oh, yes. Thank you. Yes, yeah, socks. Yes, we always have socks and underwear, and we always we're always looking for socks, um, new socks and new underwear, probably to to give to the people that come to the shower truck. That's totally a thing. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks for reminding me. And the shower truck truck comes uh, um, equipped with the towels and soap and all that. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you're yeah, not they're fabulous. Soap, okay. Oh, all right. And, and the name of the shower truck again is the Cultivate Initiative. Uh-huh. Okay. I'm just checking my notes here. 
Sure. So, uh, this is uh, just, I'm just very, myself, very bowled over by your story here. I just had no idea that all this was going on in that church. So close to us. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, what? So close to us. So close to our neighborhood. Close to us. Well, you drive past the church and everything. You do. Quiet little church as you drive down. <laughs> oh my gosh. No, not a quiet little church. No, I see that. I see that. Okay, right, so what do you get from Oregon Food Bank? Um, so this is actually super interesting. So um, I, um, I'm the substitute. So when Kristen, our manager, goes on vacation, I sub for her. And so this last couple of times, I've been the one that did the ordering from the Oregon Food Bank. So Oregon Food Bank, um, so our goal is every time we give people a bag of food to have a variety of stuff in it so they can make a couple of meals. So there should be something tomato-y and some beans and some vegetables and some fruit probably, you know, and, and some pasta or some rice. Or, and when we can, we try to put in things that might be more culturally specific. And um, we have a lot of folks who come to our food bank who have um, some sort of connection with Southeast Asia and they will ask us for rice and oil. So we try to make sure we give oil all the time that we can. And once a month, we try to give oil out. And um, so... So we can go on. So you can go online when when you're a, when you belong to Oregon Food Pantry. You can go online during the week and you can look and see what's available to you. They they give you a shopping list and you can just go in and claim the stuff on the shopping list. And then um, um, I, I've learned the hard way that you need to be careful what you ask for. Um, you have to be really balance it well because sometimes it might not get filled, but then sometimes it might, or you might order chicken and you get all the chicken you wanted, but it turned out to be in really big boxes that don't fit in your freezer and it has to stay frozen. Um, so if you don't have any, you don't, you shouldn't order chicken if you don't have very much freezer space. Um, and so we try to give some meat, some meat and some eggs every week to everybody. Um, and then sometimes we, you know, our goal is to have enough. So if each of the bags is, is equivalent to each other, we, we want everybody, no matter what time they come to us, to get about the same amount of stuff and about the same stuff. But you can never order enough stuff in a week to make everybody get green beans. So, you know, so most people are going to have green beans, but maybe a few people are going to have, you know, some other sort of peas. Maybe they're going to get peas in their bag. So um, you just it's a kind of a big balancing act. OK, very interesting. Thank you. Yeah. For this amazing presentation. Does anybody else have any questions? Okay. All right. Well, we're gonna we're gonna advertise you to our mailing list, and um, uh, and do you have um, a way for people to donate? Or you're gonna you're gonna post this GoFundMe? I'll I, I'll send you I'll send you a um, I should have done it earlier, but I'll send you a, we have a little handout thing that I'll send you a screenshot of, and I'll get you some info. So. Oh, perfect. All thank right. you, thank, thank you. you so much for letting me do this. It's so kind of you. Oh well, this was fascinating and really valuable to learn about. So thank you, thank you for um, sharing this incredible resource with us, and uh, you you did a great job. <laughs> thank you. Um, so. Um, in the interest of time now, let's uh, go on to uh, Linda Goltzer. You want to tell us how, how about the demo garden and how wonderfully it did this year? <laughs> sure. Um, in our uh, or on our one acre um, educational demonstration garden, we grow small fruits and vegetables that we donate to local food pantries like, like the Woodstock Food Pantry. And this year we have donated 1,900 pounds um, out of the garden. And uh, we also have, we also maintain several perennial uh, garden beds that show how to, that show the uh, home gardener how to incorporate native plants into their landscape. Um, this year we enjoyed 270 visitors to our garden, and um, that's just people walking in off of the street when we have our gates open, and um, you all are welcome to come visit any time that we're open, and we do close down very soon now for winter um, in a, just a couple of weeks, but we open up, up again in March. And we're open on Mondays, Tuesdays, and Thursdays from nine to noon. So um, I, I try to come either to every uh, board meeting here or often. 
I have forgotten the last couple, but um, <laughs> so in the spring, um, we'll have more information about visiting and uh, Brentwood Darlington and the Master Gardeners just finished uh, Sparrowhawk Native Plant Sale where we uh, partnered and uh, had a very um, successful event. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I thought it was. I thought it was a big success too. Yeah, the the atmosphere was wonderful. People yeah. were very happy to be picking up their beautiful plants. And, um, and one thing that I me might mention to Chris is, we have donated to your food pantry for several years, and I never knew that you guys did all that you said you do. So I know in the Woodstock uh, newsletter. There's this little little ad that about the food pantry. You should have them do an article on what you what you do uh, one month. Yes, write down, write that note down. Have them do an article of all of the stuff that you that you provide because that is amazing. Yeah, it really is. I am yeah. still bowled over. Um, yeah, thank you. Okay. Oh, well, thank you very much, Linda. And I, I'm so happy that you came, to, uh, you made it um, to, to our meeting tonight. Um, and uh, I'm sad that the garden is closing down, but of course it's no fun to garden in the mud, right? In <laughs> the freezing snow and so on. So. Yeah, we don't, we don't, uh, have not as yet um, planted a winter garden. So that's why we closed down over the winter. Mm hmm Maybe okay. next year. <laughs> Maybe next year. Okay, very fine. Thank you. Thanks a lot. All right. So um, why don't we move on to um, items of public interest? Uh, I'd like to tell you a little bit about uh, Hazeltine Park. And let, let me see if I can um, hold on. I can't share yet. Wait, how do I unshare? Okay. Um, I didn't bring up an article. I mean, I, I didn't bring up a, um, the image that I should have, but I don't know how to stop sharing now. Maybe I'll, I'll, I'll share something and then stop sharing. And then I can start all over. I do beg your pardon. I just wanted to show you this image from um, uh, from the from Hazeltine Park. It's not gonna be it, that's a board agenda. Okay. Okay, here we go. Okay, can you can you see now this um, this this photograph of the kiosk at the Hazeltine Park? Do you all see that now? Okay, so on the left hand side, you can see that um, some people took spray cans and they sprayed all over the open bulletin board side, and there's a big blot of of paint on the acrylic cover. It's a door to um, an enclosed site. Uh, so Tina um, uh, cleaned off the acrylic and she cleaned off this, this blotch of paint that you see here. And uh, it looks like Parks Maintenance um, spray painted the right-hand side, which is an open cork board that anyone can post on. And I got up there and I, um, I don't have a photograph of this, but I spray painted um, the, the cork board that's underneath the acrylic door. Uh, so it's the, the kiosk is in much better condition than it was before. But as, as I was examining it, I could see areas where though it's becoming weathered, the paint needs to be scraped and, and then reapplied and so on. So over time, we'll get it back into better shape. And um, so this, this painting was done I don't know, about three weeks ago, and we haven't had any repeat vandalism of the chaos, but somebody has um, spray painted one of the rocks in the park. 
it happens to be the color that I used on the bulletin board. And so I I hate the um, the vandalism, but I love the color. Um, and so maybe next time I'll be able to, to show you a photograph of the, the fully painted kiosk. Anyway, we it was very disturbing to see this kind of uh, vandalism to the to at the park, but um, we're um, we're trying to reduce it now. Okay, so I'm going to stop sharing that, and and let me see. Oh, then I also wanted to just tell you verbally about. Kegro, which is the Korean American retail grocers of Oregon, um, BDNA has been helping our local convenience store owners who are suffering from extensive vandalism, theft, and threats to personal safety. And we actually have got a promised um, meeting from Commissioner Rubio. Um, Commissioner Mingus Maps actually met with us. And then we are now be going to meet with uh, Carmen Rubio and then some other people from the city. And we think we're gonna be able to get funding for the stores to repair some of the vandalism that they've suffered because their insurance companies won't cover it anymore. They're threatening to cancel their insurance if any more claims are made for uh, damage repair. So the stores are really in, um, are under siege and it's not fair. And we um, we depend on these stores, you know, they're scattered throughout our neighborhood. We have five of them mm -hmm. all owned and operated by Korean American families. So, and I'm just uh, really happy that BDNA is, has been in a position to do what, what neighborhood associations are supposed to do, which is advocate for their um, local business people and residents. And we've been able to get good attention from both Mingus Maps and Carmen Rubio. And um, I've got my fingers crossed that we're, we're actually gonna see some uh, financial resources applied here. And um, uh, we were invited, we board members were invited to attend their annual bank banquet of the Korean American Grocers of Oregon. And so um, I uh, have accepted invitation and Kim DeLeo and her husband are gonna go too. So we'll be representing BDNA a week from tomorrow night at a at a big banquet up at the Doubletree um, Hotel. So you never know <laughs> where things are going to, to lead. You know, it's very, um, uh, very interesting. I, I never knew that there was an association of Korean American retail grocers of Oregon. And, um, and, and now I do, and I feel very, I mean, that we're very enriched by having our, our stores in the midst and having this association and getting to know the, the members of it. So anyway, we'll tell you about the banquet after, um, after we <laughs> attended. And then uh, finally, the third um, item, and I'd like to have Laura Lee talk about this, if you don't mind, Laura Lee, concerns this um, development problem that's arising in Brentwood, Darlington, and, and certainly in other parts of Oregon, I mean, uh, Portland, that has to do with the residential infill project, which was um, approved a couple of years ago, and it changed the zoning so that it allowed developers to build multi-unit buildings on land that formerly was exclusively restricted to single unit houses. And um, so several times now in our neighborhood, I, th I can think of uh, four instances and maybe a fifth um, where developers have um, demolished a house and then started building and nobody knows what it is they're building until all of a sudden they see that it's it's a four unit or a six unit, two story, huge uh, edifice in their in in their neighborhood with which is just all single family houses that are kind of s small and low to the ground and and, <laughs> and they're certainly much smaller than the, these big buildings and um, then they get a notice and Laura Lee why don't you go on tell tell what happened in your neighborhood um so. It's interesting because everybody 
in our neighborhood, we want more housing. It's not that we're against the multi-unit um, housing going up. It's uh, it's something that we support because uh, we do need some more homes. Um, but in my neighborhood, on my street, we're all, all of our houses are pretty much single story houses. And a lot of us don't have central heat or central AC. And, um, and so there was right behind me, kind of category behind me, there's a 5,000 square foot lot. And gosh, Stephanie, what was the, it was a 550 square foot house that was on the lot, very tiny. And we, as neighbors, we got a, a notice that they were going to uh, demolish the house. It was sold and the house was going to come down. And of course I ran over to see about the tree situation and there was a tree and the tree stayed. Um, and then we were not notified of anything else. So we just assumed that they were going to build another house. And then we saw the foundation going in and it's like, that is the biggest house I've ever seen going on this lot. Um, and then it ended up being, it's a four unit, two story, um, uh, multi unit. And it's, it's so squished in there that it's sideways. Um, and they're going to have concrete on both sides in the front and back, you know, for a patio and for walkways. Um, and it, it was just interesting because none of us knew that it was going to be this, this large building. And had we known we wouldn't have been opposed to it, but we would have been able to say, Hey, you know what, uh, are you going to build some trees or any sort of barriers and where are people going to park? And we just would have liked to have more information, which we did not receive. 